Here on The Secret Sits, we truly value our listeners and other great podcasts. We love to help promote our friends and their shows. Here's one of them now. We really hope you enjoy. Ooh, I've been dying to try this place. Oh my god, me too. I've heard such good things about it. Welcome to the Crime Diner. I'm Cindy. I'll be cooking for you this evening. Here are your menus. Ooh, what are you thinking about getting? I don't know. Murder with a side of cannibalism? What about you? Ooh, that sounds good. I'm torn between historical mayhem and the social injustice, maybe? Oh. I just want to let you know that each episode comes with dinner, dessert, and a specialty drink chosen by yours truly. Wine Dine and Storytime has had a makeover, and we invite you to slide into the booth with us at the Crime Diner, where each week we will discuss a crime over dinner, drinks, and dessert. See you there! Today, I am going to start with a question. What would it take to bring an entire segregated city to its knees? What if I told you it would only take one woman who was simply tired of giving in. Welcome to The Secret Sits. I'm your host, John Dodson. Join us every Thursday as we uncover the secrets behind the world's most fascinating true crime cases. You can find all episodes of The Secret Sits for free on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you are hearing, reach out to us on Instagram and Facebook at The Secret Sits Podcast or on Twitter at Secret Sits Pod. Now, on with our story. Obviously, the title of today's episode is a bit tongue-in-cheek. I clearly do not believe that Rosa Parks was a lifelong criminal, but that is how she was perceived by some. Today, I am going to tell you about the life of an American icon, and I am going to do so as much as I can by telling her story from her perspective. Because of this, I will be using the exact verbiage Rosa Parks used referring to African Americans as black people and occasionally using the word Negro. Nothing in this story is intended to be offensive to our listeners, and we have been as sensitive with this content as we could possibly be. We hope you enjoy. One of Rosa Parks' first formative memories is when a white man treated her like a regular little girl, and not specifically a black girl. World War I had just ended, and the year was 1919. Rosa was around five years old when this interaction took place. Moses Hudson owned the plantation adjacent to the park's home in Pine Level, Alabama. One day, Moses stopped by their house while his son-in-law was visiting. This man was a soldier from up north. He leaned down to the small girl and patted her on the head and said that she was very cute. That evening, it was all the family could talk about, how a Yankee soldier had treated Rosa like she was any other little girl. Rosa was raised in her grandparents' house there in Pine Level, which sits pretty close to Montgomery, Alabama. Leona Edwards was Rosa's mother and a teacher. Her father was named James McCulley. He was from Abbeville, Alabama. James was a skilled builder and a carpenter, and he traveled all around the country building houses. After the couple married, they relocated to Tuskegee, Alabama. This is the home of the Tuskegee Institute, opened by Booker T. Washington in 1881. This is now 1912, and Tuskegee had become a model of good race relations, according to both black and white leaders in the area. Rosa believes that maybe this 
was the reason her parents wanted to move to the town. After moving to the new town, Leona was able to get a job teaching at a school, and James easily found work building homes. On February 4, 1913, Leona and James welcomed little baby Rosa into the world. She was named after her maternal grandmother, Rose. Leona did not work leading up to Rosa's birth, and James was frequently away on his building jobs. This led to a bout of depression in the 24-year-old mother-to-be. In 1913, pregnant women did not typically move about and socialize like they do today. Back then, when a woman was pregnant, she would primarily stay cooped up inside of her own house. After Rosa was born, she was a bit of a sickly child. At some point, James's younger brother came to stay with the small family, and that was another person for Leona to care for. Leona's dream in Tuskegee was for James to get a job at the institute. You see, teachers at the school were given a place to stay, and their children were educated at the school for free. At this time in the South, black children had very few opportunities for education. But James did not like it in Tuskegee, and he decided that he wanted to move back to where his family was from, in Abbeville, Alabama. The whole family begrudgingly moved with him. James was from a rather large family. His youngest sibling was eight-year-old George Gaines McCulley. George did not like Rosa at first. He was used to being the baby and being lavished with attention. But eventually the two bonded, and most of what Rosa knew about her father's heritage was taught to her from George. He told her that his father's grandfather was unknown, but rumor was he was a Yankee soldier who had fought in the South during the Civil War. His father's grandmother was a slave girl who was part American Indian. And that is all she knew. And even this bit of information could have been partly rumor. Leona was not happy in Abbeville. And when her husband James took a building job up north, she decided to move back to Pine Level, where her family still lived. At this time, she was pregnant with the couple's second child, and she left Rosa to stay with James's family until the new baby came. After the new baby arrived, James came to stay with his family in Pine Level, and the family lived together until Rosa was about two and a half years old. James needed to find work, so he left to get a job. The family would not see him again until Rosa turned five, and her new baby brother, Sylvester, was three. James returned and stayed with his family for about a week, then he left again. Rosa would not see her father again after this until she was already a married adult woman. Rosa's first memory of herself is a time when her maternal grandfather took her to the doctor. She was around three years old at the time and she had chronic tonsillitis as a child. She was dressed in a red velvet coat and matching bonnet. Rosa said that she could remember everything the doctor asked her to do, opening her mouth while he used a tongue depressor to see into the back of her throat to evaluate her latest bout of tonsillitis. After they returned home from the doctor visit, her grandfather raved about how good she had been and how she had followed all of the doctor's directions. Everyone doted on her and she remembers how that felt. It felt nice to have people praise you and say nice things about you. What a lovely first memory. Growing up with her mother's family allowed Rosa to ingest much more about this side of her family than she would ever know about her father's side of the family. Rosa's great-grandfather had the family name Percival. He had been a young Irish boy who had been brought to the United States on a ship. Although he was white, he was not a free man. At this time, in Europe, poor white people would sometimes become indentured servants, where they would sign a contract with someone who would pay for their ship fare to travel to the United States. In return for this, the indentured servant would then be required to work for a person or family 
in the United States for a predetermined amount of time to pay back the travel costs. During the years they served as an indentured servant, they could be treated as poorly as slaves. Rosa's great-grandfather was brought to the U.S. through the port of Charleston, South Carolina. He was then transported to Alabama. The family he was required to work for were in Pine Level, Alabama, and their last name was Wright. After serving his time with this family, he married a young woman named Mary Jane Nobles. Mary was of African descent, and she was a slave and a midwife. Together, they had three children, two girls and a boy, while still in enslavement. After slaves had been freed, the couple had six more children who were all born free. After the Civil War ended and slavery was abolished, many black people just stayed where they were. They did not know the world outside of their small existence on a plantation, or they knew nothing about anything outside of their small towns. Rosa's great-grandparents stayed in the same cabin on the Wright's land and kept working. The only difference was that they knew that they were free to go if they chose to do so. After a time, the couple purchased 12 acres of land for themselves. Rosa's great-grandfather built a big, sturdy table so that his family could have a place to eat altogether. Her grandmother, the oldest of the children at six years old, stayed up at night holding a burning wood knot so that her father could see to work on the table. Rosa Parks owned and used this table her entire life. After Leona had taken Rosa and Sylvester back to Pine Level, she obtained another teaching job. But the one small black school in Pine Level already had a teacher in place, so Leona taught at the school in neighboring Spring Hill. Leona's school was too far away for her to walk to and from each day and also have times to make her lesson plans, so during the week Leona stayed in Spring Hill with a nice family. Rosa enjoyed living with her grandparents. They would take her fishing at the nearby creek, and she would help the elderly couple bait their hooks with some wiggly earthworms. Sylvester would follow Rosa around everywhere. He would mimic her words, and he was very mischievous. Rosa was very fond of her little brother, and she was protective over him as well. One day after Sylvester had gotten into some mischief, his grandmother picked a switch to whip the boy. But Rosa jumped in front of her young brother and said, Grandma, don't whip brother. He's just a little baby and he doesn't have no mama and no papa either. She lowered the switch and looked down at the small girl. Sylvester did not get a whipping on that day. As life told away and Rosa reached the age of 10, she knew that she had a very strong sense of what was fair and what was not. While walking down the road one day, a white boy named Franklin started badgering the girl and then he balled up his fist and threatened to punch the girl. Small Rosa picked up a brick on the road and dared the boy to hit her. Franklin gave it a thought and decided it was not worth the trouble, and he walked away. Rosa thought very little about this interaction, but when the memory sparked in her brain a few days later, she told her grandma what had happened. Rosa's grandmother immediately scolded the young 10-year-old girl and told her that she needed to learn how to talk to white people. She told her that she cannot talk or act that way around white people, and if they did anything to you, you could not retaliate. This, of course, upset Rosa. She felt that she had just as much right to defend herself as anyone else. Her grandmother told her that if she was not careful, she would be lynched before she turned 20. Later in life, Rosa would come to understand that her grandmother was attempting to curve her behavior around white people out of the fear for her well-being. But after this Franklin incident, Rosa did not even encounter many white kids. White kids played with white kids and black kids played with black kids. They attended separate schools, separate churches. So exposure 
was at a minimum. Rosa and Sylvester attended the black school in Pine Level. The schoolhouse was built on land for a black church called Mount Zion AME Church. Rosa also attended this church. The school housed all of the children in the same open room. About 50 kids attended the school. They sat in rows according to their ages. Because Rosa's mother was also a teacher, she had been the girl's first true teacher, and Rosa could already read when she began attending school. The second year she was in school, Rosa got a new teacher, Miss Beulah McMillan, who all of the children called Miss Beulah, and she had been a teacher for a very long time. In fact, she had been Rosa's mother's teacher when she attended the same school. The small schoolhouse had a wood-burning oven sitting right in the middle of the room. It was the only source of heat in the class. To maintain the fire, the larger boys would sometimes have to go outside and cut wood or bring it inside when the fire grew dim. It was up to the lone teacher and her students to provide for themselves. The brand new white school did not have these problems. They had heat in their building that did not have to be maintained by the students and their school had been built with public money provided by taxes paid by white and black residents of the town. The black children only attended school for five months out of the year, while the white children attended school for nine months out of the year. The black children were needed to work their land and do other chores around their homes. Some of the white children rode school buses, while there were absolutely no buses for black children. Rosa recalls when she was walking to school and the white school's bus would pass her. Some of the white children would yell out of the windows at her and throw their trash at her. Pine Level was a very small town, so even as segregation grew in the South, Rosa did not encounter things during her childhood like water fountains marked colored and white. What Rosa did encounter during her childhood was the KKK. They would ride through even small towns and set fire to anything owned by black people. They beat black people and even killed them with no repercussions. As a six-year-old girl, Rosa did not understand why there was a sudden surge in Klan activity. But it turns out that when black soldiers were returning from fighting in World War I, they returned acting as if they deserved to be treated equal to whites because they had fought for this country alongside of white soldiers, equally. After some time, this surge of violence died down in Pine Level. The first time Rosa went to a big town was when she turned eight years old. She traveled to Montgomery, Alabama with her mother in a private car. There was a bus that went to Montgomery, but black people were not even allowed on the bus. Sometimes they were allowed to ride on the roof of the bus with the luggage. It was just easier to travel by private car. And when they arrived in Montgomery, they had to stay with other black families because black people could not stay in hotels or boarding houses, even if they could afford to pay. Rosa and her mother stayed in Montgomery for the entire summer so that Leona could get her teaching certificate recertified. After this summer, when the two returned to Pine Level, they discovered that the small school building on the church's land had been closed. All of the children from Pine Level now had to walk all the way to Spring Hill each day for class, eight miles in each direction. But Rosa was excited because now her mom would be her teacher, and she thought that Leona was a great teacher. Leona remained Rosa's teacher until Rosa turned 11, Then she went to Montgomery to continue her schooling. While in Montgomery, Rosa attended the Montgomery Industrial School, which everyone in town just called Miss White School, because a woman by the name Alice White was the school's principal and co-founder. Miss White was Caucasian, as were all of the teachers, but all of the students were black girls. Miss White was originally from Massachusetts, All of the teachers were from up north. 
and because these Yankees had moved to the South to educate black girls, they were ostracized by the local community. They could only maintain a social life with black people, so they all also attended black churches. Rosa had her tonsils removed before starting at her new school. It took her small body quite some time to heal from the surgery, but after she did, she never had to worry about missing school because of tonsillitis again. Children, even in Montgomery, primarily walked to and from school. There were no buses in the town at this time, but there was a streetcar, and if the weather was bad, they would sometimes take the trolley to school. When black people rode the streetcar, they had to move as far back as possible. Now living in Montgomery full-time, Rosa began to encounter some of the segregationist things that did not exist in her small hometown of Pine Level. Public water fountains were marked colored and white. Rosa remembers spending time in her youth just wondering if the water from the white-only fountain tasted better than the water she was allowed to drink. She also wondered if the colored water fountain ever made any different colored water. During this time, Rosa lived with her aunt Fanny. Fanny's husband had died, and she was raising her own four children as well. Their house was just a smidge outside of town, but the only way to walk there forced the children to walk directly through an all-white neighborhood. One day, while the children were walking home, a white boy on roller skates came passing by the group of children, and this boy pushed Rosa hard trying to knock her off of the sidewalk. Rosa turned back to the boy and pushed him in return. The boy's mother was standing nearby and saw the altercation. She began yelling at Rosa for pushing her boy and threatened to have her thrown in jail. After this altercation, Rosa was moved to a different part of town to live with different relatives. Leona did not want to take the chance of this happening again. In the school, the girls learned subjects like English, science, and geography, but mostly girls' education was centered around home economics. Back then, it was called domestic science. The girls learned to cook and sew, and they learned how to take care of people when they were sick. This included how to make beds, feed the sickly, and provide overall care in the home. This type of training was necessary for these young black girls because black people could not, or would not, go to a hospital. So when black people were sick, they were taken care of at home by black women. But in all of the lessons Rosa learned at Mrs. White's school, the most important lesson was that she was a person with dignity and self-respect, and that her sights should never be set lower, just because she was black. After attending the school for three terms, the school was closed. Miss White had become too elderly and frail to keep up with the three-story brick schoolhouse. She moved back home to Massachusetts, where she died a couple of years later. Just by happenstance, as Miss White's school closed, the first public middle school for black students was opened in Montgomery. There were still no black high schools, if black students wanted to continue their education after middle school, they had to move to Birmingham. So that fall, Rosa began attending Booker T. Washington Junior High School. She attended the school until she passed the ninth grade. Aunt Fanny had also moved. She was no longer living outside of town, and she lived in a black neighborhood that was safe. So Rosa moved back in with her to attend middle school. Rosa would go with her aunt when she worked cleaning jobs at the local Jewish club. They simply called it the Jew Club. Rosa could not remember the real name. One day while at the club with her aunt, Rosa and Annie May, one of Fanny's children, went out to pick some berries. As they walked around picking berries, a white boy saw them and told them off for picking up the berries. The girls defended themselves verbally against the white boy, and then later, they recounted the exchange to Aunt Fanny. She was very upset about the situation, and she scolded the girls, saying, You all crazy? You keep your mouths shut. If he'd gone and told somebody, 
they would have had y'all lynched, and all we could do was cry a little about it. This was Rosa's second lesson in not talking back to white folks. After finishing all of her levels at Booker T. Washington Junior High, Rosa attended grades 10 and 11 at the Alabama State Teachers College for Negroes. It was possible for black students to attend the laboratory high school at the college as a program used to train black teachers. One month into Rosa's 11th grade year, her grandmother fell ill and Rosa had to drop out of school to tend to her. She passed away just one short month later. Rosa was now 16 years old. Rosa met Raymond Parks through a mutual friend. When they first met, Rosa was not really interested in dating this man. He was too light-skinned. He almost looked white, and Rosa had an aversion to white men, excluding her grandfather. Rosa was in her late teens at this point, and Raymond was in his late twenties. He worked as a barber in the black barber shop downtown. Raymond came to Rosa's home, where she lived with her mother, and Leona invited the man in. The two started to become acquainted, but Rosa was very shy, and she was not interested in Raymond. He came back time and again. Rosa was hide in her room, pulling the sheets all the way over her head, and she just refused to come out. But that did not stop Raymond. He kept showing up. So Rosa started to go on little rides in Raymond's car. He had a little red Nash with a rumble seat in the back. Everyone called him Parks. He was born on February 12, 1903, in Weedowee, Alabama. Both of Parks' parents had died before Rosa entered the picture. Parks told Rosa that he had grown up the only black kid in an all-white neighborhood. The school was also all-white, and the black school was too far away for Parks to attend. Because of this, Parks had no formal education, but his mother had taught him to read and write at home. Parks did not let white people take advantage of him. This was something that Rosa noticed quickly. Parks had been working as a sexton at a local church. Part of his job was watering the new shrubs the church had just planted. But like anyone knows, you water when the sun is not blazing hot. A white woman told the pastor that Parks was not doing his job of watering the plants. She was a 1930s Karen. But Parks explained to the pastor that he did water the plants. The pastor said, Miss Jones told me you didn't water it, and if her husband knows you dispute her word, he will sweep up this churchyard with you. Parks looked at the pastor and replied, I didn't water it in the middle of the day, but when I was supposed to, to keep the sun from scorching it. And Mr. and Mrs. Jones will not sweep up the churchyard with me and neither will you. Parks always carried a pistol in his pocket for protection. Parks was also the first activist that Rosa had ever met. He was a long-standing member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP. Parks was helping to raise money for the Scottsboro Boys. If you have never heard of this case, the Scottsboro Boys were nine young black boys who had never even met each other before they were all arrested for raping two white women. Haywood Patterson, Eugene Williams, brothers Roy and Andy Wright, Clarence Norris, Charlie Weems, Olin Montgomery, Ozzie Powell, and Willie Robertson. They ranged in ages from 14 through 19, and they had been hoboing on a freight train which traveled through Tennessee, Georgia, and Alabama. This was the era of the Great Depression and many people hoboed on trains to get around looking for work. At some point, the white people who were hoboing on the train began throwing gravel at the black riders and telling them to get off of their train. I picture Vincent Schiavelli in the movie Ghost yelling to get off of the train, but maybe that's just me. The black people on the train, in an effort to defend themselves, tossed their attackers off of the train around Stevenson, Alabama. 
When the train reached Paint Rock, Alabama, the train stopped to load some water. A white mob was there waiting. They were carrying sticks and rocks and guns, and they forced the black boys off of the train and threatened to lynch them. But the police broke up the mob. The police arrested the hoboing young men, white and black, and they were taken to the closest jail in Scottsboro. The following morning, police took the black boys out of the cell and lined them up. In walked two white women, Ruby Bates and Victoria Price. Ruby Bates pointed out six of the nine boys and claimed that they had raped her. Victoria Price did not pick out any of the boys, but the police held the other three boys and charged them with the rape of Miss Price. A trial followed on April 6, 1931. The Interdenominational Minister's Alliance raised $50 to get the boys a lawyer. This man met with the nine boys for 30 minutes before the trial. The trial was split into four trials in all. All four of these trials lasted for only three days in total. Both of the women testified that the boys had beat them and used guns and knives. The police had not recovered any guns or knives from the boys, and the doctors said that neither of the women had any bruises, scrapes, or cuts. No indication that anything had happened to them. The judge, however, did not care about the actual facts or evidence. He just saw this as a waste of his time, and he sentenced eight of the nine boys to die in the electric chair. Only the youngest boy at 14 was not given a death penalty. The case made major news across the country, and soon the NAACP was getting involved in the case. They were able to get the execution date pushed back as they filed an appeal. In November of that year, the United States Supreme Court ordered a new trial based on inadequate assistance of counsel. Parks was working on the Scottsboro Boys case right from the beginning, and all of the white people began calling anyone on the boys' side of the case communists, because when you cannot articulate an actual grievance with another person, you simply call them a word that's scary to you, like communist, and hope it sticks and everyone is on your side. It's truly pathetic. Rosa and Parks had gotten more comfortable around each other, and one day Parks just looked at Rosa and said, I really think we ought to get married. Rosa agreed. So that Sunday at church, Parks asked Leona for her permission to marry her daughter. This was in August of 1932. The couple were wed in December of 1932 at Rosa's mother's home in Pine Level. After the couple married, they moved to Montgomery, and Rosa decided to go back and finish her schooling. In 1941, Rosa obtained a job at the local joint Army Air Force Base Maxwell Field. President Roosevelt had issued an executive order forbidding segregation on military bases. This went for all public spaces, trolleys, and buses on the base. It was a strange experience for Rosa. All day while she worked on the base, she lived an integrated life. She sat next to white women on the bus, but when they left the base, the white women rode in the front of the bus, while Rosa had to go all the way to the back. The Scottsboro boys were finally saved from execution, although the last of them was not paroled until 1950. Parks then moved on to voter registration. He was upset about how few black people were registered to vote. In the United States of America, voting is an important right. We vote for someone who holds our values to represent us at the table. And if or when they do their job poorly, we can vote for someone who will represent us correctly. But in the South, many black people could still not vote, and they had no representation at the table. Segregationists made it very difficult for black people to register to vote, 
In order for a black person to register to vote, they had to have a white person vouch for them. When some of these black people became registered to vote, it changed them. All of a the sudden, they acted like they were a different class of black person, and they actively tried to block other black people from registering. For the times, I maybe can understand a little of this. Their lives had gotten better, and they feared other black people may mess up what they had going on, but it was still wrong. As much as Parks tried, he never did get registered to vote while he lived in Alabama. There were plenty of white people who said that they would vouch for Parks, but he wanted to do it on his own. These were his rights. The first time Rosa Parks attempted to register to vote was in 1943. They kept making registering to vote difficult and complicated, a tactic to make people just give up. The registration office would open at random times, and you had to call and ask when it would be open. The office would open on a Wednesday from 10 a.m. till noon, knowing that most black people were at work during these times. Also, if you did find out when they would open and you showed up, you still may not get a chance. No matter how many people were in line, they closed the doors tight right at noon. If you made it in the doors, it was still difficult to register. They preferred that you owned land, but if you did not, you had to take a written test. This was veiled in the guise that you had to understand the U.S. Constitution in order to vote. Rosa finally made it into the office one day, and she took her test. When white people registered, they received their voter certificate right then and there. But if you were black, it would be sent in the mail. After Rosa took her first test, they told her that she had failed. No explanations were given. It was at the whim of the person working in the office. So the next time Rosa went and took the test, she copied out her answers to the 21 questions word for word so that she could check them if, once again, they said that she had failed. But that did not happen. Rosa passed the test, and she received her voter's certificate in the mail. Next, she had to go pay a $1.50 poll tax, this was required once per year to keep your voter card. In this, there is once again a racial disparity. White people only had to pay the poll tax for that year, but black people had to pay the poll tax retroactively. At this time in history, you had to be 21 years old to vote. Rosa had not registered to vote until she was 32, so she had to pay $16.50 in retroactive poll taxes. At this time, this was quite a lot of money, and it was another way to discourage black people from voting. Everyone knows or assumes that they know the story of Rosa Parks on a Montgomery city bus. But the incident you have heard of is not the first time Rosa was put off of a bus. On Rosa's second attempt to register to vote, she was put off of the bus on her way. You see, there are specific rules that black people who wanted to ride the bus were made to follow, and Rosa did not follow the rules. Now, some of these rules were made up by the drivers, and they had the authority on their buses to enforce their made-up rules. For instance, some drivers would not even let black people walk down the bus aisle to take their seat. Oh no! Some drivers made black people come in the front door of the bus to pay. Then, they had to leave the bus to walk around to the back door and get on at the back door. But some bus drivers were mean, and after the black people paid for their ride and walked off of the bus to go to the back door, the driver would just drive away before the black person was able to get into the back of the bus. A Montgomery City bus has a total of 36 seats. The first 10 seats are saved for white bus riders, even if there are no white people on the bus. There were 10 seats in the back of the bus, and it was understood 
that these seats were intended for black riders. If the seats in the back of the bus were filled and the seats in the front of the bus were empty, the black passengers would have to stand. They still could not sit in those seats. Conversely, if the front seats were filled up with white riders, the driver would make the black people in the back of the bus stand up and give up their seats to the additional white riders. The middle seats were dictated by the bus driver. The bus drivers were armed with pistols and they maintained a police power over their buses. The bus drivers were expected to enforce all of the segregation rules themselves. The first driver who put Rosa off of a bus was a big mean man. He was particularly mean to all of the black bus riders. It was the winter of 1943, and the back of the bus was crowded with black bus riders. It was so full that black people were even having to stand in the stairwell to the back door. When Rosa got on the front of the bus to pay, she simply turned and walked down the aisle of the bus to get to a seat. As she turned around, the big ugly bus driver was standing staring at her, and he told her she had to get off of the bus and walk around to the back door. Rosa said that she was already on the bus and did not see the need to get back off of the bus to walk around and try to squeeze through all of the people standing in the stairwell. The man replied that if she did not go through the back door, she had to get off of his bus. The man walked down the aisle of the bus and took Rosa by her coat sleeve and led her back to the front door of the bus. But as they reached the front of the bus, Rosa dropped her purse on the floor. Rather than bending over or squatting down to pick up her purse, she sat down right on the front seat, the white people only seat. And then she leaned down and picked up her purse. This made the driver even more upset, and he yelled at her to get off of his bus. I will get off, Rosa stated calmly, but I know one thing, you better not hit me. And Rosa stood and walked out of the front door of the bus. Rosa did not get back onto the bus, and after this incident, she became cautious of who was driving the bus before she boarded it. She never wanted to be on this driver's bus again. By this time, Rosa was now also a member of the NAACP, along with Parks. There were almost no women in the organization. It was still considered dangerous at the time. In December of 1943, the group met for the election of new officers. Rosa went to this meeting hoping to run into an old school friend from Mrs. White's school. Alas, Rosa's friend was not in attendance this evening, and Rosa ended up being the only female who showed up to the meeting. So the men asked her if she would take notes and act as secretary. She politely agreed, and that evening, the men elected her as secretary for the Montgomery Division of the NAACP. There were only two women who attended meetings, Rosa and her friend, Johnny Carr. Sometimes the president's wife would attend a meeting, but she was just there as an observer. Part of Rosa's job as secretary was to keep records of unfair treatment or violence against black people. On September 3rd, 1944, a woman in Abbeville named Reese Taylor was making her way home after church when she was kidnapped by six white men, raped, and let loose without any of her clothes they had torn from her body. The driver made a full confession and even named the other five men, but a grand jury refused to indict the men. There was a young black man named Jeremiah Reeves who worked as a delivery boy. Well, he had an affair with a married white woman every time he went to her house to deliver a package. One day, a nosy neighbor went and peeked through the window and saw the two getting it on. But then the white woman saw the neighbor in the window and she immediately began crying rape. 
this young man was convicted and sat on death row for several years until he was executed when he turned 21 years old. In another case Rosa worked on, a very well-off widower was having relations with a black gentleman. She had converted her garage into a bedroom for their fornication. People became suspicious, and police came around and found the couple in a state of undress, and they attempted to arrest the man. This woman refused to say that it was rape. She admitted that they were having an affair, so the police arrested her. She gave the black man as much money as she could, and he left town. The woman stayed in the town, but was ostracized, and a few years later, she committed suicide. In the year 1954, Rosa Parks became friends with a white woman named Virginia Durr. Miss Durr and her husband lived in Birmingham, and they fought hard to help black people. They did not possess the same racist ideology as even their own families had. This was the same year that the United States Supreme Court made the decision on Brown versus the Board of Education. The Brown versus Board of Education decision ruled that segregated education was unconstitutional. The separate but equal clause was used in this decision because no matter how you look at it, education for young black people in the South was no way equal to the education white students were able to receive. The NAACP had been working on this case since 1925, 29 years before winning this first step in a battle that will rage on to this day. Two NAACP lawyers, Charles Hamilton Houston and Thurgood Marshall, brought this case before the court. In the 1960s, Thurgood Marshall would become the very first black person on the Supreme Court, 55 years later, and we have only just received our third black member of the court. Rosa Parks has now been removed from a Montgomery City bus once. Next week on The Secret Sits, we will finish our tale of the life and crimes of Rosa Parks and we will witness what people can do to affect change when they stand together and do not accept being treated less than. The Secret Sits podcast is researched and written by me, John Dodson. Audio engineering by Gabriel Dodson. Original logo artwork provided by Tony Lay.